Happy Sabbath, everyone. Every week, things seem to get better. To God be the glory. Great things He continues to do. You know, um, I, I was observing the, the talents that God has given to His church. I watched Le Grant as he dissected the word with a lesson review. And Mackenzie on the guitar. As I watched Sister Clark, Sister Marsh as they sang from deep down. I think you know deep down singing? From way down, giving their all. And then I was surprised by a lot of I didn't know you were a saxophonist. Hello, Tom. I'm a good friend, man. And you keep that so secret. And I'm glad I'm in church today. So at least I learned one more talent that has been granted to the Ephesus body. Thank you, technicians, who help to make sure the sound is good, everything is going well. Sometimes we forget them. They work so quietly in their little corner. This morning, I want to acknowledge part you play and to thank you for your dedication. It's good to see everybody. We have visitors in our midst and we are so thankful that God has sent you to us and we pray that you will be blessed tremendously as you share with us today in the rest of our worship experience. Good to see your first elder, his two sons. You know, the leadership of the church sometimes is very demanding. Uh, when you can come to church and sit down, other people have to be thinking about a lot of things. <laughs> Thank you, Elder David, for marshalling the program today. To God be the glory for everyone. So there's nobody in a mask in church today. Amen. Amen. Look what the Lord has done. Oh man, I remember coming here, there was sanitizer at the door, temperature check, mask, and everybody on the lockdown. Look what the Lord has done. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. Great things He has done. I'd like to let you know that there's a health program that is coming up from the Atlantic Caribbean Union. How many of you have heard about it? Special health program all week, starting tomorrow. If, um, if you haven't, we will of course post the links so that you can be a part of it and to share in that wonderful health initiative by our union headquarters, Atlantic Caribbean Union. Also, we are, we are praying for the, at the 1st of October, there's a, there's a plan to reopen the borders. That's the plan. We, we, we will be praying in the final week of September about this plan. Alright? We will come together as a church to pray. If it is not the will of God, change the plan. And if it is the will of God, put a blanket over the Cayman Islands to protect his people. Amen? Yeah. So we're going to be having a special prayer initiative last week of September and we would like for you to keep that in mind. You will hear more about it starting next week and onward. Immediately when we finish your divine service today, we'd like to meet with the Ephesus members for just less than 10 minutes, maybe 5 minutes or so, just to bring an item to your attention so that everybody can be on the same page. But for now, we are going to focus our minds on the word of the living God. He has placed a message in my heart for the church today. I, I don't preach anything that doesn't move me. If it doesn't move me, I cannot preach it. 
I beg the fence to stand in and preach for me. But the Lord has to speak before I do. So today's message is entitled From Story to Testimony. From Story to Testimony. And the key idea is that it is not enough to have a story. God wants you to have a testimony. You see, a story is fixed in the past. But a testimony carries you into the future. Can I say that again? Yes. See if it makes some sense. A story is fixed in the past, but a testimony carries you into the future. Your story is a roundabout. You can't get me on it. But your testimony is a highway. It brings you somewhere. If you stay with your story, you will go around in circles. But if you go with your testimony, it takes you where you need to go. Your story cannot be transferred to anybody else. <laughs> but your testimony is for everybody else. Am I making some sense to you? So the word today is entitled from story to testimony. Shall we pray? Father, please forgive me as I've asked you before, but I confess before your people that I need your grace. So come near to me, make me whole to the power of your saving grace. May you be pleased to use me now as a vessel to speak a word of life to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody has a story, but not everybody has a testimony. You see, your testimony is what you make of your story. Now, I need a church to, 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 to help me today because I want to make sure you're with me. If you sleep, I will think you're not with me. But if you show me your understanding, it helps me to go forward. Right? So your, your, your testimony is what you make of your story. It is the value that you extract from the events of the past that give meaning and power to the present and the future. If you do not extract value and meaning from the events of the past, you do not have a testimony that is helpful in the present or helpful for the future. I often hear people telling their stories and confusing their stories for testimonies. They talk about what God did in the past without giving any meaning of the value of that experience for the present or for the future. If you only have a story, you don't have a testimony. The topic today, from story to testimony. So let's go to the Word and see what spiritual ideas are developed on this topic. Let's begin with the Passover. The Passover in Israel was instituted by God on the eve of the Exodus. And many of you who are students of the Bible know that in Exodus chapter 12, Moses gave instruction 
to the children of Israel as they prepared to participate in the Passover and as they got ready for departure from the land of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 4, the Bible tells us, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So Moses said to the children of Israel, This Passover that is being instituted today must be commemorated throughout the history of your people. In Exodus chapter 12, 26 to 27, the Bible says, And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? Hello, somebody. I like that. So, your children who were not here when the Passover was instituted years down the line, they will come to you and ask you, what does this mean? They were not there. And they will ask that you shall say it is a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed the head and worshipped. Let's go to Exodus chapter 13 in verse 3. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt out of the house of bondage, for by strength of the hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. Going on here. You see, the Exodus experience was designed by God to be an anchor point in Israel's history. I'll say that again. The Exodus experience was designed by God to be an anchor point in Israel's history. It was to be the main point of reference for their young, fledgling faith. They had been in bondage for over 400 years. Many of them had forgotten the promises of God passed on by their forefathers down to the second and third and fourth generations. And now, in the land of Egypt, in the house of bondage, enslaved by Pharaoh, God was about to give them a new anchor point for their faith. Watch the story as it develops. The Exodus story was to be the proof of God's presence. In Exodus chapter 3, all the way through to Exodus chapter 40, if you read the Bible carefully, you will find that all these chapters of the Bible are emphasizing the proof of God's presence, starting with God's theophany.
company, his appearance at the burning bush when he appealed to Moses and gave Moses the proof of his presence. From that point onward to chapter 40 of the book of Exodus, God struggles to make clear to the people of God that his presence was with them. The proof of God's presence. God's presence is all the believers really need. For 400 plus years, God had appeared to be absent from the life of the nation. They called upon God, but it seems that he was nowhere to be found. And in the depths of their despair, as the Egyptian whips were upon their backs, they groaned and mourned in their spirit as they cried out to God, Where is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob? But it appears that God had disappeared. But now, starting with the theophany at the burning bush, God had suddenly reappeared in a dramatic way to show that his presence was with his people. So here we find the story of God's proof of presence developing. Come with me. It's a fascinating event in history. The Exodus was supposed to be the anchor point from which Israel would in the future interpret every event in their lives. We're building, we're building, we're building. The Exodus was to establish Israel's identity as belonging to God and as God owning them. So come with me as we explore this fascinating idea. Over 80 times throughout the Exodus experience, God appeared to the children of Israel and declared, I am the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Time and time again, God appeared to Israel and declared to them, I am the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. You need to understand why this was happening. For God had appeared to Abraham. God had appeared to Jacob. God had appeared to Isaac. And those stories of God's appearances were well known to the children of Israel. But God had apparently not appeared to Israel in their 400 plus years in Egypt. Where was the God of Isaac? Where was the God of Jacob? Where was the God of Abraham? He seems absent and silent, but the Exodus was to be the establishment of a new relationship where God was not only the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but he had come to be the God of a slave driven people named Israel. He says, I am the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. He was establishing a new identity not only as the God of your fathers but your God. I am the God. No wonder the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 begins with the preamble where God was reminding the children of Israel he says I am the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and the basis on which you are required to keep these commandments is that I have called you and chosen you and delivered you and I have marked you as my own. If you don't know God, why are you keeping Ten Commandments? It is only out of the relationship that obedience became important. So let me move. 
I will start in the sermon here. Setting the stage. But the Exodus was to mean something else. The Exodus experience was to become Israel's testimonial. So that everywhere they go and every circumstance they face, they could look back at the Exodus and draw strength from the assurance that the God who delivered them would be able to deal with their situation. It was God's design that the Exodus experience should always be the point of reference for Israel to go back to when they found themselves in trouble, when they were lost, when they were hungry, when they were in threat of opposing nations, they will always go back to the Exodus to know that the God who delivered them was able, capable, and willing to be with them. The Exodus was to be a big movie. Can I try to make it clear? So, 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 the Exodus was not to be opened in the tiny cinemas of the world, but it was to be a mega event. It was not supposed to be a little story whispered about by a few people, but the Exodus was designed by God to become the headline news for the world. Let's, let's, let's dive into it a little bit more. So, so the YouTube <laughs> and the Facebook and the cable news network of the time were all supposed to carry the Exodus story. It was like Cayman Islands defeated the U.S. in a military conflict. It was to be world news headlines. And God ordained it as a big event in history. So let's dive into the story and see just four ways in which God blew the Exodus story larger than life so that it would be cemented in the minds not only of Israel but the nations of the world that there is a God who is large and in charge. First of all, God made sure that in the Exodus story, the high drama story, it was a story of how slaves conquered the greatest nation on earth. It was a story of how nature's might surrendered to nature's maker. And there were four ways I would like to highlight how God ratcheted up the trauma of the Exodus. The first one is that he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, 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 I know this is going to open up a theological debate, but I, I, I did my homework, <laughs> right? And so, the story of the Exodus revealed that Pharaoh hardened his own heart in the beginning, but God also hardened Pharaoh's heart. Come with me to Exodus chapter 4. Verse 21, in Exodus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. In Exodus chapter 4 and verse 21, we read clearly that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. I can tell you that Pharaoh hardened his own heart, but God also hardened his heart. And the Lord says in verse 21 unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. But <laughs> I will harden his heart. That's what God said. I will harden his heart and he shall not let the people go. Sometimes 
problems we have is that we like to defend God. Hello? And we don't like anything to sound bad about God. So we twist things to make God look good. But God doesn't need our help. <laughs> right? God doesn't need our help. God says, listen, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Not done it. Come with me to Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have. No, watch this now. In case you did not understand, Exodus chapter uh, 4, verse 21. I hope you understand Exodus 10, verse 1. In Exodus chapter 4, God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. But in Exodus chapter 10, God says, no Moses, you go in because I have hardened Pharaoh's heart and the heart of his servants. But listen, God has a reason for it. Hello, I hope I'm coming through to somebody. God had a reason for this. That I may show these my signs before him, and that thou mayest stare in the ears of thy sons and of thy sons' sons what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that he may know <laughs> that I am the Lord. I said, God said to Moses, I'm going to pick a fight with Pharaoh. But I don't want it to be a little battle. Hello, somebody. I want somebody seeing where the world is going this morning. God says, I want a fight with Pharaoh. But I want a big fight. I don't want Pharaoh to just say, go. I want Pharaoh to say, no. So that when I let you go, everybody will know I put Pharaoh's back. I will hard his heart. I will make him resist. And then I will break him. So that the story will be larger than life. If Moses had gone to Pharaoh and whisper, God said, let the people go and Pharaoh said, let them go. Nobody would be talking about Exodus today. But God says, I'm going to harden his heart. So that he will fight. So that I will win. And the name of God will be known in the earth that I am mighty to deliver. Amen. So, so, let's go back to the story because I don't want to preach too long today. So, let's go back to the story. One, God hardened Pharaoh's heart to make the story a big story. Then God says, listen, when Israel is going to leave Egypt, I am not sending them out empty. <laughs> because if they leave empty, it may seem that Pharaoh run them out. But I'm going to bring them out with a mighty substance so that the world will know it was not Pharaoh who kicked them out, but it was God who brought them out. They have worked hard for 400 years. They're not going away empty because they need to establish an economy and they must come out with wealth. So God hardened his heart and God says, I'm not sending Israel out empty. But watch this. I like this part of it. God not only picked a fight with Pharaoh, but he picked a fight with Pharaoh's gods. Now you don't understand this. You don't understand this, baby. I pray to God that the Holy Spirit will help us today. You see, you need to, to realize that it was not just about the conquest of Egypt's kings, but 
it was to be the conquest of Egypt's God. So when God said to Moses, go throw down your rod. <laughs> this was not about Pharaoh. It was about Pharaoh's God. For God knew what the magicians would do. Call him upon the name of Egypt's God. So God was not satisfied to just conquer Pharaoh. He included Pharaoh's gods. He wanted to crush not only the king, but the God of the nation. And then, you notice what God did. He not only led Israel by the known way, but he carried them by the difficult way. Brought them to the Red Sea. Mountain on either side. Because the story was not yet big enough. Hold on, hold on. I said the story wasn't big enough. So God led them by the way of the Red Sea. And then God conquered nature by parting the Red Sea. By suspending the laws of nature. Because he was the God of nature. And as Moses went through with the children of Israel, he drowned Pharaoh's army so that the world news of the time would have it on the headline. Pharaoh has not only been crushed, but he has been killed. Big world news headlines. And the reason behind this was to make sure not only Israel, but the nations around would understand that the God of Israel was mighty to save. Yeah. The Exodus was a big event. I want to take you to somewhere that's sad and discouraging. Because after Israel told the story of the Exodus time and time again, the story lost its meaning. The story lost its testimony. It was only a matter of a history event but its appeal to trust in God was no longer attached to the story the story had lost its testimony and it could no longer inspire them so let me share this with you it was God's intent that every obstacle Israel would come upon they would remember the story of the Exodus. And they would apply the meaning of the story, which was, we can trust in the mighty hand of our God. They should never be afraid. For the God who did Exodus was with them. There was no reason to be fearful. So the story was to be their testimony for the present and for the future. But let me show you what happened. They were to live the story's idea, but instead they told the story without its meaning. So by the time, just to illustrate this to you before I go back to the key ideas and move this message towards its conclusion, so, so, look what happened. When Israel was conquered by the Babylonians, they remembered the story of the Exodus, but they didn't remember its meaning. So they became very depressed. God had to say, Isaiah chapter 43, Isaiah chapter 43, talking about
about the story of the Exodus, look what God said to them in verse 18. God says, remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Pause there. Pause there. God said to Israel, don't even think about the Exodus anymore. Because the Exodus was no longer inspiring them. God said, you remember the story, but you don't remember the testimony. So I've got to do a new thing. Hello, somebody. God says the Exodus, the shine has come off the ball. And now you only remember the story without the meaning. So God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going to give you a new anchor point. I'm going to let waters flow in the desert. I'm going to do something new. For your story has lost its testimony. The power of the story is not in the events of the past but in the reinterpretation of its meaning every time you come upon a new challenge. Can I say that again? Let me say it again. The power of the story is not in the events of the past, but in the reinterpretation of its meaning every time you come upon a new challenge. Your story tells what God did for you in the past but it is not a testimony of how you are living in the present God healed you in the past that's your story but your testimony is now I've become a vegetarian I wonder if I'm getting through to somebody I was sick I was on my dying bed and God healed me that's your story that's not your testimony. Your testimony is that as a result of what God did, my life has been now transformed. And I live a brand new life as the meaning of God's healing gives me new direction. That's your testimony. But if you only have a story without a testimony, it is of no good. To say, God bless me, but you don't have a testimony of how you have been faithful with the blessings of God. Your story is meaningless. God wants us to move from just a story to a testimony. God wants us to apply need to the events of the past so that we can cope with the challenges of the present and the future. God healed you, but you're not exercising. You haven't changed your diet. Hmm? You're still sitting up and going to bed 12 and waking up 4. You're not getting enough rest. You have a story, but you don't have a testimony. God bless you financially in the past, but you didn't return a faithful time. You have a story, but you don't have a testimony. Your testimony is going to be, Lord, I was unfaithful, but you've been good to me. And as a result of your blessings, I will always return what is rightfully yours. That's your testimony. Amen. Too many of God's people only have stories, but no testimony. Israel had a story without a testimony because they stopped applying the meaning of the past to the present and to the future. You know, sometimes when you go to testimony services, you hear people talk about the same testimony of what God did 20 years ago. You wonder what happened since? What happened since God healed you 20 years ago? Every 
Every time he testifies the same story. But has God been good since then? How has that experience changed you? That's a testimony. So let me wrap this up. It is not the story which is a testimony. It is how you use the story. It is how you are using your encounter with God in the past to give meaning and encouragement to your present and your future. That is your testimony. God wants you to be like David who had a story with a testimony. It was in that moment when David was going through tough times that David encouraged himself in the Lord. He said, I was young. <laughs> I wonder if anybody's in the church today. He said, I was young, no old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seen begging bread. David encouraged himself in the Lord that the God who came through for him in the darkest moments of his life was the same God on whom he depended to deal with the current challenges that he was facing. Job had a story with a testimony. Job says, I know my Redeemer lives. And even if worms destroy this body, I know in my flesh I shall see God. Job knew what God had done for him in the past. And no matter what his friends told him, he knew that he was anchored in God. And God would one day justify him. Daniel had a story with a testimony. For when Daniel was called, when the handwriting was on the wall, Daniel was able to tell those who were over him, look, I know a man who can, I know a God who can reveal the meaning of this thing. And Daniel said, listen, back then in the days, he did this and he did that. And I'm confident that he will now reveal the secret of the handwriting. He had a story with a testimony. He used God's miracle in the past to give meaning and strength when he faced a challenge of the present. I like a man born blind. He had a story with a testimony. For when the people came down on him and said, what thinkest thou of this man? He said, listen, don't ask me anything. There's one thing I know. I was blind. Now I can see. So I have a reason to trust in this man. What do you say? You have a story with a testimony for what God did in the past. Give you strength and courage for the present and for the future. In COVID-19, we have a lot of stories. But what will be our testimony? stories of the goodness of God. Oh, I hear some people saying, the Lord helped me to get a good pension refund. <laughs> That's a story. But well, what's a testimony? I don't need to go any further. I'm saying to you, my brothers and sisters, your story needs to have a testimony. They're not the same things. Your story is a roundabout. Your testimony is a highway. Your story is where you have been. But your testimony is where you are and where you're going. Your story is something that happened to you. Your testimony is a meaning that you draw from your story that gives strength and courage for the present for the future. My prayer is that you don't just remember the exodus of your life, but you remember the meaning of the God who delivered you. So that when you're faced with a new Red Sea, when you're faced with a new Pharaoh, when you're faced with a new uh, enslavement, you 
can trust in the delivering power of the God who led you in the past. May God inspire our stories and move them from just a story to a testimony. For your story is only for you, but your testimony can encourage the world. I'd like for us today to close the service by singing, Faith is a victory that overcomes the world. Encamped along the hills of light, he Christian soldiers fights. And press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be heard. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Number 608. And I pray that each of us will turn our stories into testimonies. Amen. Shall we say? That's correct. Turned to me and said, 
I want you to do the final prayer for me. And then what the Lord woke me up this morning at 4 o'clock to tell me was confirm that I need to open the altar so that people can come here and meet Jesus. Amen. You see, pastor is a vessel that the Lord used mightily today Amen. to tell us that he has given every single one of us in church today a story. Yes. But he's, he's telling us that with that story, we must have our testimony. And we must move on with our testimony. So today we are going to open the altar. I'm going to ask the deacons to please come and help me remove this, this pan here and, and put it somewhere else. Move some of the chairs back because the altar is open today for every single person. And the invitation is to come to Jesus. Amen, Amen church? Amen. I'm going to ask my singers. They're going to sing. That is what this altar is for. And if you feel moved by the Holy Ghost, I'm going to ask you to step out of your place. And I'm going to tell you to come to Jesus today. Because with Jesus, everything that you need is with him. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. So, uh, my singers, I'm going to ask you to, to, to sing that song for us. And as the song is sung, as the Holy Spirit move up in your heart, come to Jesus today. With Jesus, everything is possible, church. The service is nearing the end. The choir is singing just as I am. Come to Jesus, my friend.
say hallelujah. hallelujah. Let me hear the church say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you know that Jesus is worthy, come on, give him the highest praise. Hallelujah. God is good, church. I stand here as a living testimony that God is good. I stand here as a living testimony that God will deliver. I don't care what the situation is. God will deliver. I've had, I've had so many testimonies. My life is a living testimony. I've seen God deliver us over and over and over in my life. And if I stand there and don't give a testimony this morning, I will be quenching the spirit of Almighty God. Church of Living God, I work at an institution where I don't know what happened. The devil just decide that they're going to get on my case. And from president to, to, to intermediate director and everybody, they decided they wanted me out of the institution. And when it was time for uh, 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 the, the time for them to make their move, in that same very time, my mother got ill and suffered. I moved back and forth looking for her until she finally died. And even then, there was no mercy that was shown. I was fired from the institution. But before I was fired, the president who wanted to keep me out of the institution, they advertised his job in the paper because the church of the living God was praying. And because people were praying. The dean is fired. The person who, who, who would go, and I understand when he would make his presentation, he would be so ec ecstatic. He's fired from the institution. The president's secretary who is not only racist but decide that I must leave, she is fired. And many others have been fired. That was 2018. Fast forward to 2019. The person who this white man from the UK who live on Ireland and, and marry in one of the prominent families, they gave him my job. Six months into the job, they say it's not, it's not working out. We're begging him to come back, Mr. Smith. And I was adamant that God leave it that I'm not going back. I took my Bible and my arm under my arm and I was on the road every day with the Bible workers in the crusade everywhere. I'm just doing God's work. And I was adamant I'm not going back. And God spoke to my heart through pastors and many people and said, go back and take the job because it's the Lord's will. And back in this, in the, um, I went and took the job. I've been promoted to director. I've, and since I've been promoted, I've seen so many miracles. I've seen the hand of God. And every time the trials come back, I remember when I was fired. They're talking about taking a testimony forward and using it in the present. When the trials come, I remember how God led in the past. Church of the living God, every one of us standing here can remember that something that God has done for us. Some of us were not always Christian. We were on the scrap heap of this earth and God rescued us. The same God who rescued us is the same God who has the power to deliver today. Amen. I know we were waiting on somebody. Come on in, my friends. Come on in. God is good. Come to the altar. Come straight to the altar. Don't stop. Come straight to the altar. Come to the altar. That's what this altar is for. Can we get that last, the first verse one more time? That's what this altar is for. Come on. Come on up, my friends. Come on. I want to pray for you, especially today. I want to pray for this family. Come on. Don't sit down. Come on. The service is nearing the end. God is good. Come on, the church ought to say amen. Yeah. The church ought to say amen. God is good. Just as I am, and as it comes, the whole song is played. People at the altar are kneeling down to
Deliver us, Jesus. Deliver us, God. Pray for our pastor. Continue to use him, O oh God. Continue to bless his ministry, O oh God. Bless his dear wife that stand by his side. O oh God, may you lift them a little higher in Jesus. May they continue to lead your flock, Lord, until, until the ship is landed on Zion. O oh God, we bless your name today. Take charge of us, O oh God, as we go with you. Remember the visitors who came to the altar, God. May they not only run off with the physical blessing, but may the spiritual blessing be on them as it is on us, O oh God. And they may endeavor to give their heart to you. We bless the name and tell you thanks. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. 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 I bless you so much, brethren.